Welcome back to uh, another great interview with Max Hilsdorf here of StatWorks. He is a data science consultant out of Germany, and his job is basically to educate people like me and all of you on AI technology. And specifically, we're going to talk about, obviously, these generative AI models. Uh, for this part two of our interview this time around, I really want to start off with talking about the emotional response that I've certainly been feeling and also receiving from a lot of you guys that are following me here on YouTube and in Sync Academy. And it generally comes in one form or another of what the hell is the deal with these data scientists and these researchers that are basically pushing the bounds on this stuff and essentially just threatening our way of life. And maybe, you know, are they even aware that they might be destroying uh, human creativity, like entirely, not just in the music world, but in the, you know, film and in the visual arts and in, in all types of sort of like creative mediums, these AI models could potentially destroy human creativity. So um, I feel and I see a lot of rage out there. I, I see and feel for sure a lot of worry and concern. Um, this, these are big challenges for sure. I think as I got first into the AI space, I was definitely much more at a 10 level in terms of my anxiety, my worries about this, my my anger and my sort of like, what the hell is going on here? You know, just confusion. Um, I feel like my personal levels have calmed down quite a bit now that I've just gotten better educated on it. I think I just didn't know what was going on and it just felt like a tidal wave was coming at us very quickly and it felt very scary. So Max, I want to kind of just dive into this with you. It'll sort of be kind of an unstructured, you know, conversation will be necessarily interview format. But um, do you feel this anger and this frustration and this worry from music composers and producers? Do you ever get messages about it um, or just see it online in various formats? And how do you respond to that kind of um, concern out there? Yeah, I think, first of all, it makes sense to have also this, this interview less maybe structured, more like an actual conversation, because... I mean, I'm not here as a data science expert to explain to you how the, the future of humans will look, right? I can explain to you the technical details, but right now talking about this topic specifically, I'm here as a, a general human, I'm here as a musician myself, I'm here as an educator where, who is kind of confronted also as work uh, at work with other people's fears in this domain, whether it's text or music or whatever, right? Um, and I'm also, of course, here as a data scientist, but it's a mixture of that. So don't don't take anything I'm saying like for the absolute truth. I also have just my personal opinions of this, and maybe I come from a different angle than many of you guys in the audience do. Uh, so that is definitely something that can be helpful. But just uh, uh, um, yeah, so be, be considerate. It's not like the the one truth I'm stating here. But I think like one thing that's I think that you can logically uh, say is that. I don't. I can't imagine that these models destroy human creativity because what's creativity? And of course, there's different definitions for this. But creativity has something to do with like combining different ideas that are out there in the world into something new, where you're like, hey, this is more than the sum of its two parts. This is a new idea that has been generated through a, gen a creative process from existing informational material in the world. And um, playing music on the guitar, if you're coming up with some composition, that is creative. Writing a text prompt and combining the things you know about which music you like and turning this into a nice sounding musical piece through a text to music language model is creative. I think you can't argue that this is generally a non-creative task. I think what people are afraid of is not that like general creativity will be lost, but that a specific craftsmanship will be lost. So the specific way of crafting music through playing instruments. And so that's the first thing uh, I want to say. I don't think you can argue that creativity as a whole is being lost. It just shifts to a different kind of craftsmanship. And I do understand why people are afraid of that, of course, especially if you're trying to make a living off of playing music. Like, I know this is, this is a hard thing to conceptualize and uh, no one has the right answer to this. Uh, so I think creativity is not being destroyed. And uh, I think... You know, like um, we had we had the same discussion over and over again. If you just go a hundred years back and you explain to someone who lived a hundred years ago, for example, that you could use a MIDI keyboard, so like this weird tapping device, and you could just press some buttons and play any musical instrument that you can imagine, and it sounds kind of good, or maybe it sounds even exceptional, right? That there will be musical sounds that you can create with this that you can also play on acoustical instruments, but it's much easier. You only have to learn one craftsmanship, which is like playing the keyboards and using the knobs, for example, instead of playing 12 different instruments. Everybody would have considered that cheating. And I have a suspicion that many people who think these new tools destroy creativity would have also thought that this keyboard would destroy a creativity. And we know that it, it didn't, right? So there are some issues stemming from this, right? And it's harder 
right now it's harder today as a I don't know, as a, a mechanical uh, instrument player, for example, to make a living off of music if you're doing purely that than it was a few decades ago. So things will change, I do agree. But I think we've had the same thing before and we're not getting less creative, right? So the tools are shifting and that comes with its own problems. But I guess that's that's also part of the discussion now. What are these problems, right? That's a great point. I, you know, I never thought about that. Just the MIDI keyboard, having all these plugins, having all these um, sounds at my fingertips. You know, I'm just yep. getting back into creating some more music myself. And it's like, yeah, I just created a track that has a beautiful piano, has some strings, has some weird uh, back reversed uh, violin sound on there, some huge drums that I got from Splice. Like, I can get anything I need at any point and I don't have to go to a studio. I don't have to hire musicians. I don't have to learn how to basically become a piano player. I can edit my MIDI notes if they're not right. I don't have to become a violin player. Like the barrier to entry to create well-made, well-crafted music obviously dropped to the floor. Now that didn't replace, and I, I agree with you there, it didn't replace the human element of somebody steering the ship here though, right? So there still has to be an element of talent um, ears, you know, you got to be able to hear what you're doing, make corrections when things don't feel right, don't sound right. And that's what's really cool about the human expression is basically what you're seeing is you're seeing, you know, some individuals filter and what kind of prompted them to make changes, go in this direction with their music versus that one. And that's what's really fun and amazing about human creativity. So I would agree with you, like, I kind of want to split the sort of music world into two different spheres. One is for sure, I don't believe that AI is going to replace human creativity as the music that we want to enjoy on a deep level in terms of like artists that are expressing deep uh, emotions or telling stories um, or points of view. I, I still think that as I listen to the music that I love, it's the human beings behind the music that I'm actually really connecting to. The music is of course the conduit to do that, but you realize like when you come a, become a super fan of an artist or a band, like, you watch their interviews, you go to their shows, you want to pay maybe for the backstage access because you're like, these are human beings that have an amazing gift, amazing talent, and maybe amazing stories that I want to be plugged into. And so if I'm listening to music that I know is just generated with an AI model, you know, none of that's really there. There isn't sort of a history of struggle that I can relate to. Maybe the AI model was struggling <laughs> to get trained, but I don't know what zeros and ones feel like when you're getting pumped into your model, right? I know what a human being feels like when it's been, you know, when he, when he or she's been neglected in his early childhood or gone through drugs or being homeless or whatever they're kind of communicating their music. That's what really kind of brings it to life. So that stuff I think will always, you know, we'll use AI tools to, to create even deeper, more meaningful music. But the other side of it is the sort of functional production music, which is definitely what we really talk about here on this channel. Um, it's music that as somebody's listening to a TV show for say, let's say, um, they don't really care if the music in the background has a story behind it or has like a human being, because we don't even really get credits anyways, mostly in our industry, if we don't get like a primetime spot. Background music, no credits usually, generally. Um, and it just needs to sort of set the tone and set the pace. So I think that's really where I have been kind of like, you know, the big threat is right there in terms of like if the marketplace doesn't care, right, for certain types of music, whether or not it's going to be, you know, AI generated or not, that's where I've been kind of coaching my members to say, hey, we need to kind of see ourselves more as these artists, not so much as like background instrumental stuff, because that stuff is going to get better and better and cheaper and faster and more efficient. And we just as individual human beings cannot just physically keep up with that. So we need to kind of shift ourselves. Um, I want to pick your brain in terms of do you see that same kind of play happening where certain applications of commercial music will certainly be interrupted by generative AI models? Do you see that coming down the pipeline? And what are your thoughts on that? Is that good, bad? Are you neutral? Where are you on all that? Yeah, so yeah, the harder question of the two is the second one, I think, right? Is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. <laughs> so the first question, I my clear answer to that is yes. Um, I, because I always, I, I, I've argued this also for, for a few years now that I've at least like um, been aware of the things going on in the generative AI space, there have always been people, also experts who were like, hey, I mean, I know you can like write texts with, with uh, AI now, for example, but music is like completely different because it's so much more complex because it's so subjective, you know? I mean, as if text wasn't like sub subjective if it's emotionally written text, right? So, uh, but it's like, um, I, I get the idea that music is like really complex and rich and you, some people had the idea that you can never 
produce music that sounds good or that is like uh, human sounding because it's just something inherently inherently human about it that you can't model with an AI. And I don't believe in that actually. I think I believe in complexity, right? So complexity is an issue for modeling. When I want to model, so like predict the weather for tomorrow, that's pretty easy to do. Like my first, uh, my first point is what was the weather today, right? And then I look into the stars a little bit. I don't know how this exactly works, but then I can pretty much be very confident about the weather tomorrow. But if I want to do a weather forecast for in half a year, that's like still virtually, not even virtually, that's like impossible to be accurate. So the reason for that is there's so many complex things that you would need to predict to anticipate to make the prediction. Um, so there are problems that are just too complicated to solve. So, uh, and as the complexity of the model grows, the capabilities of the system trying to predict or pre generate something also need to grow. And for music, I mean, we're seeing that, right? So who would have thought that something like Music LM would happen this year in January? I, I certainly didn't expect that. And who would, who would have thought that like, it only takes a few months until you have something that's more powerful, trained on less data, right? Uh, copyright protected, uh, uh, licensed uh, data that's not copyright uh, protected in this case, or not infringed upon at least. Uh, and produces better output and is open source. Like that's that's new. And I think we're continuing on this path. And like to argue that it's impossible for AI to generate music that sounds nice and can be used in a commercial setting would be to argue that the problem is infinitely complex, right? And I don't think that's the case. I think we're we're pretty close to some at some point in the future to be able to generate music with AI that sounds like actual human music, period, right? No one will be able to distinguish uh, that. And there's, of course, always like more complex types of music and applications and things that we can't expect or uh, predict, like, will humans like the music, right? So how are humans going to form and develop their musical taste across time? That's like predicting the weather, no one knows, right? So we don't need to be afraid that AI takes all of music forever, but there are some things, right? Like you can predict sales for the next week. You can predict how, you can predict how a piece of music should sound and then generate it. That's in principle possible. And I think it's coming, I, I agree. I mean, uh, and whether it's good or bad, there's, I mean, that's what, what you and your community also know much more about than I actually do. I mean, right. So um, I understand the concerns. Things are about to change and they definitely are. And that's pretty much a big, huge, just bullet point. You nailed it right there in terms of what is um, concerning about this is because I think up until AI, we all assumed that we were these magical, mystical beings, right? That language come and communicating and processing language and um, making music was such an abstract, you know, other world sort of channeling thing that we'll never be able to understand. The human brain is way too complex. We'll, and I've heard that so many times. Um, I even believed that for many years. And uh, it wasn't until I actually watched a documentary, I think it was in 2012, called The Singularity. Uh, it was either The Singularity is Near um, or The Singularity with Ray Kurzweil. And it was basically the first um, exposure I had to the idea that information technology exponentially increases. It doesn't go linearly. We think things go linearly because that's how our lives kind of move very slow. But information technology does not work that way at all. It essentially is doubling in a certain amount of time. And that's what's really sobering about a lot of this, at least for me, is that it's like we're not as mystical and mysterious maybe as we think we are. Because if we can start to replicate how a human being communicates and do it faster and better and more informed and better sources and all that kind of stuff and maybe generate art in a really cool, unique way, which I've seen in some of those, um, you know, images with some of these models. It's like, a, it's beautiful. It's amazing. Like I can't, people that are saying they're not impressed by that. I just like, I get it. It's challenging, but you can't say that's not impressive that that's possible from a tool that we created. Like, that's just amazing, but it definitely puts us into question in terms of like, well, where is our value then if these models can essentially do more than we're doing? I, I want to get into kind of like a wider, um, bigger scope with you. I, I do have a, um, uh, I have a theory as to what we're do why we're doing all this, what we're doing. Um, but maybe I want to ask you yours because you, something you brought up before in terms of um, going back a hundred years and saying to somebody back then who was composing music, we're going to have these MIDI keyboards with you know computers, and we're going to have all the software, and it's going to help you create anything you want. And people will be like, dude, that's cheating. That's way too fast. It's too easy. That's and we're, we're hearing that. <laughs> yeah, we're hearing that right yeah. now from people saying like, dude. Just pick up a learn, you know, pick up a guitar and learn how to play it. It's not that hard. It's like, well, actually, it is. I did learn how to play guitar when I was younger. It's actually a really hard instrument to learn how to play, as are most instruments, right? Um, but you can see the trend. The trend is to lower the bar in terms of the bar of entry. Hopefully, not the quality of music. There's definitely some of that happening too. 
uh, but lower the barrier of entry, allow more access to these tools, more ways to go creative. Um, where's the end goal? Like where, where do you think this may be, like what's the final piece of tech? Is there a final piece of tech that's like the, that's what we were going for, that's what all of this was about. And boom, here's where we're at. I don't know if you've had any thoughts about that. Like where do yeah. we, why are we progressing like this and where, where is the end point of any of this? I mean, I have so many thoughts about this, right? And the problem is that I have so many thoughts about this that I'm always very careful to, to kind of aggregate them and make one prediction because I know, like, I know how uncertain I am about the future because you can only be uncertain about the future. Everybody who pretends to know what, what will be happening in the tech space in like only two years or something at this point, or even five years or anything beyond that, that's just crazy, right? And it's the same thing with lots of modeling things where you try to predict how the world exactly will behave, uh, whatever it's, whatever social or political or technical thing you're trying to predict, anything that's like a few decades in the future, it's like so uncertain, you might as well not do the prediction at all. So um, my, my personal uh, philosophy, though, I, I think deeply about these topics about the future. Uh, and I do, I do try to understand as much as I possibly can, but I'm very hesitant to give predictions. And I think for myself, it's mostly just, I mean, you know, these things, they are happening and it's really important to embrace the things that are happening because let's just assume everything is going well. We, we, we have to be in the right position, right? To utilize the tools. So if those tools are going to destroy everything that we have in the world, right? If we're going to do some, some crazy nuclear weapon supercharge with AI and it's like the end of the world, I don't know. I mean, that would, that would really suck. But like, let's just assume that doesn't happen because if it does happen, like, what does it matter that I'm doing the prediction right now? So like, let's just assume it doesn't happen and think about how can we prepare for the future that may be coming that's actually a positive future or at least not a fully negative future. And I mean, so far in humanity's history, everything has been going uphill and that's been accelerating. And I think we're in the part of this acceleration. It's getting faster, 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 more and more humans get richer, richer, richer. And in terms of they have much more free time because lots of tasks are automated. There's lots of positive um, outlooks into the future and there's also some grim outlooks in the future and um, i am an optimist i tend to think things will work out fine but i also think from a rational perspective um try to prepare for for the best that's happening right but not like naively like don't be like those things aren't going to disrupt the world what i mean is assume they're they're going to disrupt the world and the way you produce music and try to think how can i be part of this future that's being uh that's being mostly determined by things I don't have control over. That's that's what I think about this. So, sorry, I don't have a, a prediction for what will exactly happen. Uh, that's, but that's I think beautiful. we can prepare for it, right? Still, even if we don't know what's happening, we can reason under uncertainty. That's we're good at that kind of yeah and we have the same mindset because that's exactly what i'm 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 saying is create a philosophy with this stuff and an action plan where you can't lose so what i've told people i'll, I'll reiterate here for anybody you guys that don't know that i'm basically saying assume ai is going to come and threaten our way of life in terms of the production music library world we should definitely assume that it might not there might be copyright laws and other problems or quality problems and people just go eh, i don't want to do that whatever might happen but it would be very foolish, I think, to just assume that won't happen and just march on as, you know, as time goes on and just assume nothing will change. Um, assume that's going to go on and definitely plan to up your game, become more of that artist, become more of a premium, organic human composer. Because um, even if that doesn't work out, like AI doesn't actually threaten us, guess where you are? You're in a much better position anyways. You're going to have higher quality content. You're going to have more creative content. So always try to find a philosophy that's just win-win. And again, just like with Max, I agree with you there, is to hold on to your optimism try to find the opportunities, try to see where you can actually thrive with this new stuff. And the few people that I talk to, including Max and a couple of library owners that I'm in contact with, though it's the people that are like keeping that mindset alive are the ones I'm hearing from every week going, bro, can, did you know that you can use ChatGPT to do this? Or did you know that I can create a model? That, they're the ones seeing amazing stuff happening. And the people that are dooming and glooming and just, you know, wallowing in the sort of sorrow of it all or the potential doom of it all, their eyes are just not filtered and not tuned to be able to see anything positive out of this. They're only going to be seeing, you know, it's cognitive um, uh, bias, essentially. They're just looking for whatever confirms that it is scary and it's going to destroy their life, right? So it's really how you tune your perspective, right? I mean, they might be right, you know, like uh, we, we could be, we could be wrong for all I know that like these things could go downhill and be less disruptive than we think. So this, this is not what happened in history to like really powerful technologies. 
like most of these technologies where people knew this is going to change everything, it actually changed everything. Like think about the internet, think about cars. And I like, I don't know, you know, there's lots of these things, uh, but it, it could be the case that it's different with AI for reasons we're not even aware of, right? Uncertainty means I'm also not certain that I'm also not certain that it's going to be disruptive. So it's, it, they could be right, but I think there's some truth to that. And I, and I think, um, everybody should should try and see the opportunity for themselves and this part of kind of like, like neglecting this uh, dis disruptive potential of the ai and being kind of threatened by that and and like as you said like dwelling in sorrow or whatever you want to call that i think that might as well be part of your personal journey to overcoming it as well so right sometimes things just suck right and sometimes th things that are happening they're not good for you or you don't feel like they're good for you and you're maybe right with that right and but all of this could also be part of your personal journey to finding a new place in this new world that's developing so i think uh, we shouldn't like i mean of course you're not doing that but we shouldn't shame people for being afraid of this or like uh, being very negative towards this because uh, i think i think at the at the end in the end everyone will be out uh out kind of following their own goals that they have and they will find their way through this new world so i'm not too worried about people in general right people are pretty good at doing what's good for themselves. So even if sometimes they're just sad and then don't know what to do, it'll resolve eventually, I think it will. Yeah, I'm really glad you pointed that out too because I I do try to remind myself to not go into that sort of like, hey, stop with your complaining about it. Stop with your like, let's just get on the sort of positive AI train because I know that that's annoying and it's definitely going to be falling on deaf ears for somebody that's actually really, because I know people are really anxious about it and really worried about it. So I do appreciate you um, reminding me of that too. Um, I think it's it's just a, it's a challenge to try to figure out. And I, I, I basically just want to double down on what you said there in terms of like when things happen to us, um, sometimes it doesn't feel good. And especially when it's a change coming into our lives that we didn't initiate, that usually is the formula. It's a change happening. We lose a job, we use a loved one, we lose a relationship and a new technology threatens our, our job. And we didn't sign up for that. We didn't ask for it. We weren't saying, I want to wake up today and have a computer do my job, right? And so it always feels just uncomfortable, but I think you're right in terms of it. In the short run, it might not feel good. In the long run, my philosophy in life is that everything is happening for you. Like even though it might be kicking your butt, really challenging, really put you under a lot of stress, it's gonna make you stronger. It's definitely gonna make you grow because it might be just a wake up call for all of us in, in our different lives and our different walks to kind of figure out how do I rise above this anxiety, rise above this fear? How do I sort of, okay, this is something I'm really struggling with. How do I consciously change how I'm perceiving the situation. I really find that that seems to be the only thing we can usually control is how we're perceiving a lot of stuff. And then once you perceive it differently, you start taking actions in different ways. So I'm really glad that you you brought that up. And I, I have to constantly remind myself because I do get the negative comments. I do get the sort of like, this is bullshit. I don't want to deal with it, you know. And it, it, it bugs me because I, I, I because I try to be so positive so often that it feels like it's like um, dissonant chords to me. It's like that doesn't even resonate with me. I don't want that around. But I do try to remind myself and I do hopefully for you guys that have given me those comments, I try to be empathetic to realize like, oh, I've, I felt how you're feeling and take your time. Like there's no rush to get through this stuff. You know, there's going to be a time and place when some of this resolves, hopefully <laughs> sooner than later, we'll figure it out. But um, yeah, man, I think that was a really good reminder for us to kind of end this one on. So Max, thank you so much, man. Um, we're going to wrap this one up for now. I will definitely have you back on if we can, you know, get some more time from you. That'd be great. Maybe uh, we'll see. It'll probably be a month or two. We'll see when the <laughs> next iteration yeah. of another AI model comes on board. We'll see if it's a meta update or if it's going to be a whole new company that comes on board. Maybe Microsoft yeah, maybe, is maybe this on time. Yeah, exactly. Maybe this time it's Apple or Microsoft. It's about time, right? <laughs> No idea, right? And yeah. so one thing, though, you said in that last interview, I hope everybody now takes heed. You said it is not wise to underestimate these models, to assume because what you're hearing right now is not that great, it'll be 20 years in the future before anything is on a quote-unquote human level. I hope you guys saw just with Google to Meta in a couple of months the progress that was made and what is probably that's a forecast a harbinger of what's going to be coming at the end of this year and into 2024 so um at least i took your advice seriously i think those of us that are really paying attention to this stuff are definitely now <laughs> hopefully now paying even more attention to it and i will i will keep you guys updated on new progress and new models as um, i become aware of them and as max becomes aware of them so go ahead and check out max's uh links below you can go check out statworks they're definitely a great company where you can kind of get um, some consulting um and some coaching and 
some education in the AI space. If it's something that you want to get some further coaching on, uh, they do amazing stuff. They put together, you know, uh, customized presentations just for you and your industry and what you're doing. So it's great for companies, it's great for organizations. They do amazing stuff as well and individuals as well. Um, and also I'll put a link to Max's um, uh, Medium articles. That's actually how I originally uh, found Max was he was one of the only people out there uh, describing all these really complex technical questions in a very easy to understand, easy to, to digest format for musicians and producers and laymen like me. So you guys should definitely subscribe to him down there on um, on Medium and just check out. He's always putting out uh, amazing new um, uh, articles that are covering all this stuff. He's basically one of the first sources I go to when something new happens in this space. So you guys should definitely get your first source information directly from Max. So Max, thanks so much again, man. Appreciate your time today, buddy. Yes, thanks a lot. It was a pleasure.